with me to Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to continue our study in Hebrews, looking at the supremacy of Jesus Christ, the name above all other names. And we're in chapter 4, and you know what? Let's read the first 13 verses together, and then we'll pray. Therefore, Since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest. As he has said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest." although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken to a certain place of the seventh, in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place, thou shalt not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter it, Because of disobedience. Again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, and there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Let's pray. God, we are so thankful for your word, and we know that it is your desire to speak to each of us individually this morning if we're willing to receive it. Lord, you are the name above all other names. We know that you have created all things, that you sustain all things, that you hold all things together. And yet you still came down and died for our sins. Lord, we thank you for that forgiveness. But Lord, we know that we're here with a purpose. And that you've gifted us, your Holy Spirit, your very Spirit living within us. So I pray through your Spirit you would open our eyes to your truth this morning. And as always, Lord, we're not just looking to grow in our knowledge. We want to be transformed and we know that you will do that work if we will surrender our lives. If we'll lay down our our agendas, our wills, our wants. So I pray for courage again this morning that we'd be willing to do that. Lord, we love you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's funny how the Lord works. It's Labor Day weekend and here we are talking about rest. It's Labor Day weekend and we're in a section of Hebrews where we're dealing specifically with those who will enter God's rest and those who will not. How many of you could have used a couple extra hours of sleep this morning? (laughs) All of us. (laughs) Thanks for uh, waking up and thanks for coming. How many of you could use a couple extra days of sleep or even a month? You're you're always catching up on that next day's rest, always feeling a little bit more tired than the previous days. Look around. People are, are tired and not just physically tired. If you think about people at work or at school, people are physically and emotionally and spiritually exhausted. I saw a tweet the other day from a a college student, and she said that when she was in high school and she was exhausted, people would look at her and say, hey, are you okay? 
But now that she's in college, if she lay down in the middle of the schoolyard and took a nap, students would walk by and say, yeah, I feel that. How many of you college students relate to that? Tired. Just, just Gabriel. I saw someone else say that uh, for them, tired isn't even a feeling anymore. It's become a personality trait. In an interview, what's your name? Oh, I'm Jim. Tell me about, a little bit about yourself. I'm tired. <laughs> okay. I think too many of us relate to that today. What's strange about this is we are the least physically active generation in American history. We're probably the most tired, and we're the least physically active. I know that's a broad brush. But as a whole, we are the least physically active generation in American history. Some researchers have even coined the phrase generation sloth for our generation. If you look around, obesity rates are... No, don't don't look around in here. but (laughs) But you see the studies that obesity rates are at an epidemic level among children and adults. And outdoor playtime... Four kids is at its lowest levels ever. Guys, we spend an enormous amount of time in front of screens, TV screens, phone screens, computer screens. I gave this uh, number to you a, a few months ago, but the average person lives 27,375 days total. And on average, we spend 19,390 of those days either sleeping or looking at a screen. That means that 70% of our lives watching TV, surfing the internet, or staring at our phones and sleeping. And part of this is simply because we live in a different time than our grandparents, We don't farm our own crops. We don't build our own houses usually. We don't change our own oil. Most of us barely mow a small patch of grass in our backyards. We got that desert landscaping going on. We're just not very physically active nowadays. So there is far less physical demands. And some of you have small children. Some of you have newborns. And you guys get a pass on this. But you were probably tired before they came along. But I don't want to focus just on our our physical exhaustion. Because in reality, we know why we're tired. We're over-caffeinated and we're under-rested. We drink too much coffee and we get to bed too late and we wake up too early. And I'm not saying spiritual exhaustion doesn't have an effect on our physical exhaustion, but I really want to focus on the burnout that we see in the church today. What we should really be alarmed with is this pervading sense of mental and spiritual exhaustion amongst Christians. This burnout that's become so common that we start to believe it's the norm. When someone falls out of fellowship or someone takes a step back from serving and they say, man, I'm just burnt out. We're like, okay, that's natural. That just happens in ministry. But that's not God's plan for us. He doesn't want to use us up and then spit us out. He doesn't want to use us up and place us on the shelf. Is that that God's character? We don't see that in God's word. Paul says in his last days, I've finished the race, I've kept the faith, I've poured out my life as a drink offering for you. He was never put on the shelf. Until his dying breath, he was living for Jesus. God's plan for us is not to be burnt out. So what are we missing? We're not getting the rest that we need. And again, I know that we could all use a nap right now, and some of you are taking a nap right now, but the reality is we need rest for our souls. And I know that sounds super spiritual, but hopefully we can unpack what that really means here in Hebrews 4. But before we start Hebrews 4, look at Matthew chapter 11. Here is probably the most famous 
part of scripture that deals with rest. Many of you could probably recite this back to me, but look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Look what Jesus says about rest. And I love this because it starts with an invitation. Come to me. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? You're so tired you can't even say it. And I will give you rest. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke. Guys, don't overlook this. Underline my. You may have the whole verse memorized, so then you have to highlight my. But take my. Whose yoke is it? It's his. It's not mine. It's not yours, it's his. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. If you have the King Ger- James King, King Germs, King James version, it says, "Learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light." I want to take a look at a few words in that section of scripture. First, the word labor. That word does not mean working hard for a set purpose, like laboring to build a house, or laboring to plant a garden, or laboring to raise kids. This is toil. This is troubled work. This is trying to dig yourself out of a hole. This is work without purpose, work that brings pain. Guys, we relate to this. When we try to crawl out of our own anxiety, or our own depression, or our own worry. It's fighting in the flesh, working in the flesh. Jesus says, come to me, all of you who toil, who worry, who fight in the flesh, and you're heavy laden. That means you're overburdened, specifically overburdened with anxiety, and worry. You see the connection there. Come to me, all you who are fighting in the flesh to escape yourselves, to escape your worry, to escape your pain, to escape your trouble. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That word rest is probably better translated refreshment. It means to permit one to cease from any movement or labor in order to recover and collect his strength. It literally, again, means to refresh. Paul uses the same word when he talks about being in prison and how Timothy and the other apostles would come and visit him and just their presence would bring refreshment to his soul. Now, God says a lot about rest throughout his word, and he starts in Genesis And we see that in Hebrews chapter 4, that in the beginning God created, or in beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and we see in that creation narrative God bringing things into existence, speaking things into existence. He says, let there be light, and there was light. He creates man, and he creates woman. And there's the six days, six days of creation narrative, but on the seventh day, what do we read? God, he rested because he was tired, because he had exhausted himself from all that previous work. That word rest means to cease from work. God doesn't need any rest. And really, God didn't need that seventh day to rest. But again, Genesis gives us all of these signposts pointing to who? To Jesus. So then in Exodus, when God gives Moses the Ten Ten Commandments, one of those commandments is very specific. It's about that seventh day. He says, remember the Sabbath. And keep it holy. You will not do any work on this day. This day is very important to me, God tells Moses. You will not work on this day. Why? 
because it was another signpost pointing to the person of Jesus Christ. Because one day a Messiah was coming, and that Messiah was going to bring about forgiveness. And that forgiveness was going to come, not through any work of the flesh, but through Jesus' finished work on the cross. Jesus is our Sabbath rest. Jesus didn't come to give us rest. He is our rest. We find rest in the person of Jesus Christ. So that's how he can say, come to me. All you who toil and struggle, all of you who have the weight of the world on your shoulders, come to me and I will give you rest. I will refresh your soul. And how will I do this? Well, you need to take my yoke upon your shoulders. Well, what's a yoke? Well, it's that wooden crossbeam that's fastened over the neck of two animals, usually oxen. And it's attached to them so that it can plow a field. You guys probably know this. I'm not telling you anything new, but we got some city folks in here. So, but it's a pair of animals. And that yoke goes across their neck. But Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. Learn of me. And what will you learn from me? That I am gentle and that I am humble. I am a servant. And I will take your needs upon my back. I will be your support. When you walk with me, when you abide in me, When you share a yoke with me, my burden is light. Peter echoes this sentiment in 1 Peter 5, 6. He says, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. Here's the problem with us. We have our own yokes. We have our own burdens, we have our own struggles, and we tell Jesus to give us rest in the midst of our burdens. But the reason we are so burdened is because we haven't taken on his yoke. We haven't taken on his burdens. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Here. We are so concerned with our will and our wants and our desires that we're stressed out about them. We're anxious about them. We've been fighting for our wants and trying to meet our needs and we're running in circles and we're running laps and we're digging holes that have no purpose. We're seeking relationships that we shouldn't be seeking. We're seeking uh, riches that we shouldn't be seeking. We're going after all these things that God has never told us to go after and then we're stressed out, and we're weighed, by the, weighed down by them, and then we tell God, give me rest. But Jesus says, no, you have the wrong yoke on you. You have that yoke on you that you had when you were the old man, that old person, your old nature. Come to me and take my yoke upon you. Take my burden upon you. My burden is not like the world's burden. If you take my yoke upon you, my burden is light. What's Jesus' burden? What is his concern? What does he think about? He thinks about the lives of others. He thinks about bringing as many people into the kingdom of God as are willing. Jesus says, take my yoke upon upon you. Let my burdens be your burdens. Don't be burdened by the things of this world. Don't be so wrapped up in the worries of this world. Let my burden be your burden, and that burden's a light one. Because if you're willing to take my yoke upon you, I will do the work through you. See, we're mentally and spiritually exhausted because we don't understand the invitation that Jesus is giving us, or we simply don't believe it. More specifically, we're mentally and spiritually exhausted because we don't understand Jesus. We're praying for him to give us rest when he's saying, I will, I've given you rest. 
But you got to take on my yoke. You got to walk with me. I'm not going to come into your yoke. I'm not going to come in and and support that burden because I, I was never in it in the first place. Drop it. Leave it on the ground and submit yourself to my will. Take my yoke upon you. You see this in our prayer life often. And we think that our prayers change God's heart. We think if we pray hard enough, and you see this again, and I hate to, to belabor this, this group, but it's such a prevalent false doctrine today, but in the prosperity gospel, it's all about demanding that God do something in your life, reminding him of the promises that he's made. You don't have that car, you don't have that house, you're not healed because you don't have enough faith, and you're not praying hard enough. But prayer is not to change God's mind. Prayer is to change ours. Prayer is to bring our mind in line with God's, our will in line with God's. Do we believe that Jesus is our rest? And isn't that what the book of Hebrews has been all about? It's been about the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus, that we have all we need in him. He is the name above all other names. He is the rightful heir to the kingdom of God. In him all things were created, and in him all things are held together. He's the perfect expression of God. He's the glory of God. He's higher than Moses. He's higher than the prophets. He's higher than the angel, angels. No one rivals him. No one is his equal. Yet he came down and became a servant for us and then a sacrifice for us. Yet when he says to us, come to me, You who are laboring, you who are struggling, you who are toiling, trying to escape your anxiety and your worry on your own, come to me, learn who I am, learn of my love for you and my power and my glory. Come to me and walk with me and rest in me. We say, no thanks, I'll handle this on my own. No thank you, I I have this. Why do we do that? That's for... Effect. I hope that really drove home that point. We say, no thanks. I got this. Or we don't even think about him. That's what the author of Hebrews here is dealing with in chapter 4. He starts by saying, a promise remains of entering his rest. We saw that promise. Come to me. The promise is the gospel. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. And I'll give you refreshment. I will give you rest. But then he, the author goes on to say, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. Keep in mind, the author is writing to believing Jews here. These are Jewish converts, Jews that came to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And he has this warning for them. Let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of God's rest. Any of you appear to have come short of God's rest. What's that warning about? Here are men and women, they've heard the gospel, they have believed it, they have received it, and they have entered into his rest through Jesus Christ. But then there's these warnings. Let us fear lest any of you seem to have or appear to have come short of that rest. And in verse 11, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. If we have already entered his rest, how can we seem to have come short of it? And why do we have to still be diligent to enter into it? And really, that should be the question we're all asking ourselves. If we find ourselves burnt out, if we find ourselves exhausted, isn't that the question? If Jesus is our rest, why am I so exhausted? That's two different things, isn't it? There's rest, and then there's exhaustion. If I'm saved, if I am born again, if I'm a child of God, and I have eternity promised to me, 
If I have entered into his rest, why am I still crippled with worry and anxiety and stress? And guys, I have to be careful here. And I struggled with this. Because there are some that have a medical condition. condition. There is a chemical imbalance. There are some who suffer from anxiety and suffer from depression. And you have heard before, oh, you just got you have to trust Jesus more. And you're like, I do, I do trust Jesus, but I can't seem to escape this anxiety. Get help. Speak to a doctor. But I'm, my fear is that we take that a little bit too far and we use that term in, anxiety and depression and we use it as a pass and we use it as something that defines us well I, I, I know that Jesus has come to me and I'll find rest but you know I got that anxiety thing going on so I, I can't I don't think there's any disclaimers in God's word so whether it's coming before him and saying Lord show me the steps I need to take to get healing or Lord if if I am depressed and anxious and crippled by worry because of all the past mistakes I've made, because I've shut you out of my life, I lack fulfillment in my life, I'm empty because of my choices, don't let me use that label to justify where I'm at with you today. I can't answer that question for you. But as we saw in the end of Hebrews chapter 4, we all are completely transparent to God. God sees everything. And his word is able to cut deep and separate the soul from the spirit. It can discern our heart, and our heart is deceitfully wicked. So it is up to us individually to go before God and say, what is the root of my worry and my anxiety? Because you have promised that if I come to you, I will find rest. So I am coming to you. Guide my steps here on out. Convict my heart. But again, sometimes our anxiety and stress and worry and depression has to do with just simply not abiding in Jesus. Toiling, digging that hole. When I, when I worked in, I say worked in construction, I worked in the yard at my, uh, where my dad uh, um, worked at a concrete company. And I kind of was a, an errand boy, mostly. And sometimes... The, lar- the, the yard manager didn't have anything for me to do. So he would say, hey, I'm looking for a wire out in that yard. Can you dig a hole and try to find it? I never found it. I don't think there was ever a wire there. So I was constantly digging holes. And that's how many of you have spent just time toiling on a project and it just isn't working out for you? You have this end goal in mind, but you cannot seem to get there. And you're spending hours and hours on a project that should have taken 10 minutes. I feel like we do that with the Lord often. Because we're not resting in him. We don't have his yoke on our shoulders. We have our own. And then we say, why am I so burned out? Why am I ready to check out of ministry? Look at Galatians 2.20, if you would. Galatians 2.20. Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And here it is in verse 21. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. I do not set aside the grace of God. 
Anytime we see the word grace, we can replace that with Jesus. Grace is not a what, it is a who. And we see God's grace through the person of Jesus Christ. Paul says, I do not set aside the finished work of the cross. God's grace for me. I don't set that aside. Why does he say that? Because sometimes we're tempted to. And when we set aside Jesus, we set aside his rest. How do we do that? How do we do that? How do we set aside God's grace? Well, we turn back to our flesh and try to accomplish in the spirit or in the flesh what can only be done in the spirit. Isn't that what Paul says to the Galatians? Oh, foolish Galatians, having been made complete in the spirit, having been made perfect in the spirit, why are you continuing in the flesh? He's pretty much saying, having been been given the yoke of Jesus, having found rest in Jesus, why are you trying to do this on your own? Paul says, I can't set aside the grace of God because if I did, then Christ died in vain. And I feel like that's what Jesus said to me as I was studying. When you try to do this all on your own, it's as if I died in vain. Flip over to Hebrews 12, verse 12. We'll get here eventually in our study in Hebrews, but I wanted you to look at this in Hebrews 12, verse 12. The author of Hebrews writes, Therefore strengthen the hands which hang down, and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Guys, we have received the grace of God. We have received the grace of God through Jesus Christ, who he is and what he has done, and that is what Paul just described in Galatians. And that's what we see in Hebrews. But we can take what we've received through Jesus and we can set it aside. We can remove the yoke of Christ and put the weight of the world back on our shoulders. And why do we do that? We do this for the same reason some people will never enter into the rest of God. Remember Hebrews 4, 2, for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. The author is saying, fear not entering his rest because of unbelief. That's what keeps us from the rest of Jesus. We set aside the Lord's rest because we have set aside Jesus and we have set aside Jesus because we've stopped trusting in him. It's interesting that the author uses that word fear. Be afraid. Really, the only other thing I can think of Scripture dealing with when, when, when Scripture says, hey, be afraid of this, is God. Not afraid of God like the boogeyman, but be, be reverent towards God. Respect God and his authority and his power and his dominion. Fear God. But it's weird seeing it here that we should fear lest we seem to have missed his rest. Because throughout scripture, what do we read? Peace is what I leave with you. This is Jesus speaking. It is my own peace that I give to you. I do not give it as the world does. Do not be worried and upset. Do not be afraid. And then we read, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. We read that there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. 
The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So we read throughout scripture, we should not fear. There is no fear in perfect love. Love casts out fear. But then here's this warning. Let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of Jesus' rest. Let us, let us fear. Fear what? Isn't this entire study about overcoming our fear and overcoming our worry? Why are we being told to fear? Well, if you look at the context here, what's that first word in verse 1, chapter 4? Therefore, and what does Pastor John say? If you see the word therefore, we need to find out what it's there for. And in Hebrews 3.14, as the author closes that chapter, for we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who having heard rebelled, Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry for 40 years? Who were the ones wandering around in the desert? Who were the ones toiling and working so hard? Instead of like Pastor John was talking about on Wednesday night, instead of going from point A to point B, who was going from point A to point Z to point X to point J before going to point B? It was those in the desert who wandered. And why did they wander? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? Why did the corpses fall? Because they died before entering into the promised land. Look at verse 18. And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but those who did not obey? Verse 19. So we see that they could not enter because of? Immorality? Because they didn't jump through the right hoops? No, it was unbelief. Why couldn't they enter his rest? Because they were faithless. So that's what the author is telling us here. We should fear, here's the only thing we should fear, aside from God himself. We should fear our unbelief. Because that is ultimately what keeps us from resting in Jesus. It's that word, but. Well, Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest, but you don't understand my job. Well, Jesus says that he loves you and all things work for good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. Well, that's fine, but you don't know what's going on in my head. You don't know what my life looks like. That's called unbelief. And we're told to be afraid of that. We are to fear that. Why are so many Christians still seeking pleasure from the world? Why are we still looking to our own resources to meet our needs? Why are we still looking to our own strength to crawl out of that hole? Because we don't trust Jesus enough to surrender everything to him. I've heard this so much over my years in youth ministry. I'm afraid to surrender everything to him because I'm afraid of what he'll take away. I'm afraid of giving him everything because I don't want to lose this. That says we do not trust in the character of Jesus. We think that our own efforts are better than what he will bring about in our lives. So I'm going to wrestle with my inadequacies. I'm going to wrestle with my depression. I'm going to wrestle with my anxiety. I'm going to wrestle with my anger. I'm going to wrestle with my bitterness and my confusion. And I'm going to wrestle with it alone. just like an unbeliever. That's why the author says, fear your unbelief because your unbelief will make it seem like you have not entered into that rest of Jesus. I'll seem to have come short of the rest I've found in Jesus. And just like an unbeliever, the promise of Jesus will not profit me if I'm not abiding in him. What a miserable life that is to have received all the promises of Jesus just to set them all aside and set them all aside for what? If that's where you will find yourself this morning, 
I can't say anything more than what Jesus has already said. Come to me. Jesus is inviting you. Come to me. Believe me. I will give you rest, but you need to take your life off your shoulders. You need to lose your life. You need to lose that yoke. And let me put my yoke upon you. Remember, what did Jesus say? If you desire to save your life, if you hold on to that yoke, you're going to lose your life. But if you lose your life for my sake, you will find it. So again, if that's where you find yourself today, toiling and struggling on your own, my encouragement is to respond to Christ's invitation. He says, come to me. I will give you rest. I will bring refreshment to your soul. Guys, we shouldn't fear giving Jesus everything. The only thing we should fear is our own unbelief because that is the only thing that will keep us from his rest. Now, does fearing our unbelief, this is, I guess, the next natural question. Does that mean we, li- we, we live in this constant fear that we're going to stumble? Do we live in this constant fear every day, waking up terrified that we're not going to trust him today? Do we live in this constant fear of our doubts? That doesn't sound like the the Christian life to me. So what what does God mean, inspiring this author to say, fear our unbelief? Well, tell me something that you're afraid of. Just yell it out. I know it's church, but yell it out. Snakes. Spiders. Spiders. It's funny, these are all men yelling these things out. (laughs) No offense. Spiders and snakes. Anyone afraid of roller coasters? Yeah. Clowns? Anyone? Yeah. An abomination. There are things that we are irrationally afraid of, but the reality is you don't wake up in the morning fearing that you're going to have to get on a roller coaster that day, right? You don't think you're going to open the door, and in the back of your mind you're like, I hope they haven't built a roller coaster here because I am not riding that thing. We have fears, but the only time those fears show their face is when we're confronted with those And that's the lesson. And those are sometimes irrational fears. The lesson here is when doubt springs up, we should be fearful of those doubts because we need to make the connection that those doubts keep us from Jesus' rest. When the enemy whispers that word, but. When we know the promises of God, we know the character of Jesus, we know that his love is unfailing, that nothing can keep us from the from his love. No height, no depth, nor no width can keep us from the love of Christ. And then he says, but does he know what you've done? Does he know how sinful you are? Does he know what you thought about? How can he love you? That's when we need to run. That's when we need to resist the devil and he will flee. Because our circumstances, as Jesse prayed, they do not change the promises of God. When we are tempted to doubt God, to doubt his goodness, to doubt his everlasting kindness, to doubt his love for us, that is when we must be diligent to remain in his rest. Man, the enemy's greatest tool, I think, is just whispering these ideas into our ears. But... I know God loves me, but I know that God sent his son to die for me, but I know I'm forgiven, but I I know I have all I need in Jesus, but that's when the radar should go off there. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. Yeah, okay, pastor, but this doesn't apply to me. I still need to work this out on my own. I still need to meet my own needs. You don't understand my struggles. And I say this as gently as I can. If that's our perspective, we are calling God a liar. That's the mindset that the disciples had when they were so paralyzed with fear when their boat was caught in a storm. You remember that. What was Jesus doing? Was cra- How many, have any of you ever been caught 
in the open ocean and a storm came. Now, they weren't in the ocean, but still. Have, have any of you ever experienced that? I experienced just a, a touch of that. It wasn't even a, it was like a light drizzle, but it was still scary. <laughs> but people die in the open ocean when these storms pass. So we can't give them too hard of a time, but they were deathly afraid. And Jesus was sleeping. Jesus was sleeping. And so they ran to him and they woke him up. And they pretty much said, Jesus, don't you care that we're going to die? Paralyzed with fear and worry. And Jesus got up and he rebuked the wind and he said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm and he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? You forgot who was on the boat with you. With a word I can quiet the storms. Sometimes we forget who's living in us. And our problems look so huge. And we believe that but. I I know God can, can handle this but. The author of Hebrews closes in chapter four with this statement. And the next two verses, I'm going to connect those next week. I think they fit better in chapter five, dealing with Jesus, our great high priest, But he says there, again, there is no creature hidden from his sight. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. We also read that the word of God is living and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. And is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So here is our prayer. I hope this is our prayer this morning. Lord, let your word pierce my heart. If I'm making excuses for myself, if I'm letting labels define me and not your promises, if I am letting what other people say about me define who I am and not your character and your love and what you've done for me and the reality that you've adopted me into your family and I am your child. Lord, convict my heart. If I'm not letting these promises, like in Luke 12, 22, do not worry about your life or what you will eat or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than birds? Who are you by worrying? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life since you cannot do this very little thing? Why do you worry about the rest? And in Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds In Christ Jesus. Guys, as God's kids, shouldn't we be the most well rested people on the planet? Jesus is who he is, and as soon as we truly believe that, we will find our rest in him.